So welcome everybody to the multiverse, the K-Dome. I'm super excited about this very important conversation, the essential art of integration of psychedelic experiences. We have an incredible panel today and I'm thrilled for each of them to share their work, their wisdom and themselves. So let's just one at a time go around and share your name and a little bit about your work. My name is Adele and I'm a psychologist from Canada and now living in the US. And um, I participate in different research projects related to psychedelic medicines, including MDMA, um, psilocybin and ketamine. Um, and I'm really interested in the topic of integration in particular and leading a couple of research projects so that we can learn how to continue to evolve these practices. Hi, I'm Deanna Rogers, and I live on the west coast of Canada. And um, I come from a bit more of a kind of traditional avenue with this, <laughs> with these plants. And so I've, I used to live and work in the Amazon for about four years. And then I've been focused back in Canada now, um, working on integration, preparation and integration um, for the last three years. And so my work has been kind of all the elements. So the preparation, the navigating the experience, and then also the integration piece as well. And combining somatic work also with uh, some of the compassionate inquiry, and then also a lot of traditional teachings that I received down in, down in the jungle. So I'm excited for the conversation today. My name is Ido Cohen. I am originally from Israel. I'm a clinical psychologist practicing in San Francisco. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I've done a six year research on the integration process of ayahuasca ceremonies from an Indian perspective. So kind of weaving a psycho spiritual approach to the process of preparation, past, uh, the experience, but more focused on integration. So really kind of trying to understand uh, the psycho-spiritual, the nuanced psycho-spiritual process that happens in integration and what we can do to support that process better to actually lead to long-term sustainable change as opposed to just having a big sparkly experience that then dissipates. Um, out of that also got birthed um, the integration circle which is a collective of therapists and counselors who we do education, uh, workshops and one-on-one -on -one and group services for people who want to prepare or integrate psychedelic or energetic experiences. And very glad to be here. Uh, thank you, Lauren, and excited to, to soul storm with all of you about this topic. Powerful group of panelists we have. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your time, and let's jump right in. So the oh, first I Oh, oh I Kyle, my goodness. <laughs> Hiding in the corner here. <laughs> uh, my name is Kyle Buller. I'm one of the co-founders of Psychedelics Today. We're an education platform and um, weekly podcast. My, uh, my background is a, I have an undergrad in transpersonal psychology and a master's in clinical mental health counseling and somatic psychology. I've been training in breath work for about 10 years. And uh, my, my integration process really kind of kicked off at a young age with a near-death experience. Um, which has been probably one of the most powerful psychedelic experiences and has really taught me a lot about what integration means. So it's been a huge topic in my life, um, created a couple courses around it and yeah, just excited to explore what this means with everybody. So yeah, thanks for putting this together, Lauren. Powerful, powerful group of panelists we have here. Super grateful for all of you and your time and let's jump right in. So the first question that I have is, about the disintegrative effects of psychedelic experiences. What gets disintegrated and what makes psychedelics a disruptive technology? It's a great question. I was actually kind of chatting about this last night with somebody who is, they just randomly stopped by my house and they were talking about having a first experience. So I was like, oh, perfect. <laughs> um, but the way I was kind of describing this disintegration process, kind of using this 
this, um, you know, looking at some of the research, um, like what's happening with the neuroscience, you know, these new neural pathways getting open and how maybe we're just functioning in one mode and being able to, to really open up and make new connections. And it really kind of just made me think of like a puzzle, right? And so um, with psychedelics, it's like we have our puzzle, our ego, our personality, our, our beliefs, our ideas, and it kind of gets mixed up um, in, in the peak experience. And then what we're trying to do is like, you know, how do we just bring that back together? Um, sometimes we add new pieces in, but we're still working with the same material and maybe, you know, we're just putting, putting it in different ways um, back together again. So just kind of, I don't know, that's the way I, I, I view that. I can add to that. Um, thanks, Kyle, for getting us started. Um, my experience of the dis like the disintegration aspects of psychedelic experience in my work anyways is that um, because of the way these substances work, we do have opportunities to uh, examine blind spots. And so when we have that opportunity, we um, have to integrate the disintegration, the new knowledge that oh no, um, this was a piece of information that I consciously or unconsciously didn't process, which means it didn't factor into my decision-making. And now that I see it, and now that I'm experiencing it, um, some of my thought structures or my belief systems or even the way I carry myself in the world needs to be revisited. And so um, it can be very um, challenging when these experiences occur. And so there is this kind of breaking down of ways of seeing, ways of being that then need to be reconstituted, you know, in a good way. Yeah, I love that you were starting with this question. You know, it's something that um, Kyle and I talked a lot about in a project we did about the shadow of psychedelics and Deanna and I talk a lot about, because, you know, for me, when you say this integration, it goes right into, right, this very popular idea in psychedelic science, which is like ego death, right? We search for that experience of the ego death and what's that about? And I think of this integration, it's like, there is actually, it's a, I think of this integration as actually an expansion. There is like a loosening of control. There is like a loosening of an identification. And then from that expansion, there is new personal, like, there's both personal unconscious material that can come up and also like transpersonal material that can come in. But something has to, there, need, there needs to be space for something new to come in, right? So I'm thinking about this integration, like what Adele said, <clears throat> you know, the parts of our, there's already research showing how, you know, the default mode network kind of goes off, online, offline and then we have access to different parts of our body our somatic body, right, in our brain that actually allows us access to memories and parts of our being that we didn't have access to before. But I think the more, or the bigger part of that maybe for the psychedelic science is that we actually disidentify with aspects of our consciousness that are, we were so identified with day to day. That's why I love this question as far because there is this search for like, oh, if I have an ego death experience, everything will be fine. The ego is the main problem here. As opposed to like, actually, if you kill your ego, you might have a problem waking up in the morning and tying your shoes. Like that's the part of you that actually synthesizes and brings all these things. But for us to think about it as maybe more of a disidentification with that one part, and all of a sudden we get to experience all these other archetypes, all these other parts of ourselves and outside of ourselves that maybe we, had, we don't have as a strong relationship with them. So it's overwhelming. Right. So like in this psychedelic experience, maybe you're all of a sudden you're in your healer self or you're, you know, you're going into a part of you that's like the, the, a new part of you. But because we don't have a relationship with it, it can feel overwhelming. It can feel devastating. It can feel somatically overwhelming, not just emotionally overwhelming. So I like to think about it more as uh, this integration is an expansion as opposed to this collapse and falling apart. And, and if anything, for us, you know, I would love for us to kind of maybe get to a point of thinking, how do we help people be comfortable with disidentifying with that part of them that they know as them? And that's how we see reality is. And like, I think about that as part of, okay, how do I support people in the integration process? So this is this integration for me. Um, I'll just add that I think a lot of the time, I think it's really important to think about why we have this default mode. 
of operating. And usually it's because we're trying to protect something that's there, but we've just been disconnected from it. And so I think that disintegration process is actually about reconnecting to a lot of pieces that have been there, but have just been pushed away or, you know, it's been too painful. There wasn't the attunement, there wasn't the support. And so with the disintegration, I really echo Edo. I feel like it's a, an expansion and a reconnection with what is there. And that can be really overwhelming because it probably was overwhelming in the past. <laughs> and that's what caused this structure to, to be created. And so, um, yeah, I, I see that a big piece of that disintegration is helping people to know that that's happening or even just setting people up before they go in terms of that this is a possibility, you know, that things may, may shift. It's about, you know, if you think about these medicines, essentially what they're trying to do is to open up and connect to what's there and also something larger, ultimately, I think. Um, and so that can be a really, a really scary, overwhelming thing for people. And so um, that's to me what the, the process of disintegration is. It's really about, okay, um, how do I start to reconnect to these parts of myself that I've, that I've lost or have disconnected from, you know, with good reason. What influences experiences in a direction of growth and change? Well, I think it comes back to actually just what I was talking about. I think it's about supporting people to have that attunement, like within themselves, the, you know, kind of giving people what they didn't have when they were younger and cause them to kind of disconnect from these pieces. To go, okay, how do we start to, you know, as a provider, how do you also start to reparent with them, but also starting to create that internal dialogue for themselves. And so for me, it comes down to support, community, connection. Um, I'd say these are some of the big pieces because ultimately if someone goes in and touches something really deep, it's going to be overwhelming. And so it's how do you give it the proper holding? Um, and so that can look like a lot of different things from it. And usually it's a pretty robust system of, of different components. So mm -hmm. that's what I would say is really essential and kind of long-term long -term change because I find, you know, with myself and also with, with clients, if you're alone with that process, again, there's so much that can be lost and not mirrored back. And so I would say it's, it really comes down to this kind of interactive and supportive piece. Yeah, I could add a, a couple of points to that. Thanks, Deanna. Um, there's two concepts that come to mind um, for me, and that is of time and nuancing. And so if someone has a psychedelic experience and they realize, oh, uh, my work isn't working for me anymore, does it mean that it's the choice between staying or going, or can they be supported to find the nuances in um, that discomfort um, or that dissatisfaction to create something that is more in alignment for them? And, the other piece is, is time. Um, you know, I've witnessed individuals kind of have revelations within themselves and accompanied with that revelation subsequently was this time, this pressure, like I need to change this whole structure now. And um, what I like to remind people is that um, what you're experiencing is truth in this moment, but that can evolve with time and also it takes time to integrate material and to um, create new structures. And so it's really important, my belief anyways, um, to respect that process of uh, time and nuance. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna piggyback on Adele's time comments, which I totally, I think time is one of the most valuable assets we have to give our experiences back, right? Is invest time in them. Um, but I think, you know, one thing that I've, I've seen um, is I think what helps is to, if we need to develop this capacity to actually stay connected to our experience, to how the importance of what we experienced and like the, the preciousness, the like numinosity of it, um, especially after the two weeks of like the sparkle period and when things start to actually contract. I think that's where there's most of the integration challenges start to come up. Like 
Adele, you said something before we started recording about when you come back to your normal family environment partnership and then all the old stuff start coming back at you, but you have a new experience, that's where the friction starts, right? That's when the pressure starts. And then usually we all get confronted with this, like, oh, do I stay close to my experience? Like, do I keep like holding it and keep opening and deepening in it? Or do I maintain my relationships? Do I keep my job? Do I keep my partnership? Do I keep the family peace, right? Whatever that is, even though it doesn't fit me anymore. Um, since we're doing this for like Burning Man, it makes me think about the Burning Man thing about home versus the default world, right? I've heard so many stories about people having amazing, like life-changing experiences in Burning Man. And then when they come back and it starts getting real, that friction starts, it gets put back in Burning Man. Oh, that belongs to Burning Man. That experience belongs to that space or to that community or to those people or to that part of me. And it doesn't get fully integrated back to the default world. And I think that echoes what Deanna said, that it starts creating this kind of like, like separation, the splitting of parts of us. And then we lose connection and then the integration kind of starts dwindling and falling apart and then it evaporates. So I think for me, there's just like an attitude of wanting to stay connected and wanting to stay in relationship with our experience, especially when it starts getting, when that friction starts coming. Which I actually, you know, to sound burning, to sound very burning, man, like I think there's actually like a very deep act of self love there. It's like, no, I choose that experience over these distractions, over my old ways, which is really, really difficult. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, something else that comes up for me, just thinking about what influences the change and growth. Um, for me, it, it, I guess it comes back to courage and curiosity. Um, really kind of having the courage to want to come back and do some of that tough work and maybe sit in the fire a little bit. And also really kind of keeping that curiosity alive to be like, you know, we always talk about this cliche of follow the process. And, and what does that really mean? Um, I mean, things are always changing things are but I, you have to be open and curious to be like, well, what happens when I start to listen to some of these insights? Or what happens when I connect back to that experience and actually follow it a little bit? And sometimes that takes courage, right? I mean, really taking that first step forward to be like, I don't know where this is going to lead, but I'm curious enough to follow it. And I have enough courage to make that first step. Um, so I think that's what I come back to think about what, what really influences that change and growth from these experiences. So much of psychedelic experience in my mind is really about disrupting the default, which has been conditioned and in many ways defensive, right? We've defined what disintegration is. Can we each define what integration actually is? Um, I guess I'll take a stab at it. Um, <laughs> I always come back to um, Stan Groff's word, holotropic. Um, holos meaning uh, whole and coming from trapeze, um, moving in the direction towards. So moving towards wholeness. And I think, you know, when we talk a lot about integration in some of our courses, I, I really think it is a very personal journey. And what does wholeness look like to you? And I really think integration is that journey. And wherever that takes you, whatever kind of um, feels whole, feels like your life is starting to become a little bit more in balance. And um, so, yeah, I just kind of always think about it in that terms, holotropic, moving in the direction of wholeness. I agree with that. You know, I think about the, the origin of the word and it really is about coming back to wholeness, coming back, you know, home even. And, and when I think about it kind of more practically in terms of what it looks like when I'm um, talking about it with um, someone who's had an experience, another, another potential way of looking at it is like translating the teachings, translating um, that which what was received um, into action and finding a way to um, smooth out the difference between what was experienced and how life is lived. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I echo everything that has been said and um, 
I think the only thing I'll add is I always really appreciate Gabamante's authenticity versus attachment. Um, and so his idea is kind of, at, well, as kids, we sacrifice that, that authenticity for attachment in order to survive because humans need that in order to survive. But as an adult, the larger cost comes when we're sacrificing our authenticity. And so it's about coming back to that. And so there's kind of this capital S self um, and this idea about, you know, coming back to actually our essence and kind of in some ways, you know, that childlike state of curiosity, of courage, of exploring uh, with the, you know, with the mindset of an adult. And so I feel like it's about kind of coming back to yourself and including kind of taking all of those pieces that make up the, the whole and kind of bringing them back. And so that's what and I would add to that. Yeah, I don't know if I have too much to add, but I do think of integration as two types of integration. I think there is one, you know, what Jung called individuation, which is a lifelong process where we are constantly cycling through this process of disintegrating, learning, integrating. Disintegrating, learning is like this lifelong thing that we're like, which I go with Diana. It's like, I think about that lifelong process as a slowly, slow process of embodying our authenticity over time, right? It's like slowly, you slowly keep embodying these pieces and return to your wholeness. I mean, I think we were whole before we were broken in some, broken in some way. Um, and then there is, I think, the more like immediate, which is this psycho-spiritual, for me, integration is more of an attitude than a tool. It's a really it's an attitude towards life. I don't see integration. There's integration tools, but for me, integration as a whole is an, is an attitude. Um, like Deanna said, it's that curiosity, that childlike permission to play, to explore, to try things without worrying about, will I make a mistake? Will I not? Will I be shamed? Will I be guilted or something like that? Um, it has to do with commitment, commitments to your process and commitments to the things that feel important to you which I think is, can be difficult. Um, and yeah, that's just, just that loving exploration of life and yourself and as, as a value, as a value that I constantly explore and love myself and continuously reflect on what's happening for me and what's happening in my life. Breaking the rules from our family of origin in order to be who we are, right? And breaking the like, ancestral chains, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot. I'm curious how each of you work within psychotherapeutic, psychodynamic contexts with trauma understanding, mind expansion, et cetera, to support the integration of psychedelic experience. I can start off um, just by sharing that one of the ways that I start my work with individuals experience who have experienced trauma and who are working to um, make a difference for themselves and their lives is I help them to make meaning of their experience and of the work that they're doing and so in some ways if it's appropriate and it depending it depends where they are in terms of the meaning making of their trauma but if it's appropriate I'll help them to see their experience in the context of um, the intergenerational processes from which they came and what I found is that actually it really helps people to feel strong and to feel committed to the process if they realize that what they're doing is huge and it's not just for them, it's for the people that came before them and it's the pe for the people who are coming next. And, um, you know, I was working with someone recently who had family trauma and of course, there was a lot of negative feelings related to what happened to them, what was allowed to happen to them. And also there was a lot of love for the family. And so I found that this can be a way for them to integrate both of those feeling states, the hurt, the anger, the rage at what happened to them, and also the love they have for their family members. And so meaning making in this kind of broader sense, I found to be quite helpful for some people. Yeah, I feel like this is a big question. And every time, um, you know, people approach me for integration work, I feel like it, you know, it's such an individual approach. And sometimes people might want like a system of how do I integrate. Um, and it just makes me think about somebody I was recently chatting with 
where they were really trying to get caught up on the meaning making aspect and you know we could get really psychodynamic and start you know going into theories and thinking about trauma history and this and that and what ended up coming up for this person was uh they really just needed to get grounded um and just saying like i really just want to um you know take on another role another job where i have connections with people because it's lacking in my life um, and it's like, yes, yes, like it doesn't always need to be so depth oriented. I mean, I, that's really helpful, but something it makes me think about when I worked with um, people going through early episode psychosis and spiritual emergencies where sometimes that meaning making doesn't come until later on until you can get grounded until you can feel safe and thinking about that trauma perspective, like, how do we develop um, you know, a sense of safety, at least in our body, so we can start to work with the material. If you had a really difficult experience, I mean, trying to bring that to the surface can be really difficult. Um, and it just makes me think, I was just chewing through some of Stan's work on spiritual emergencies. And, you know, he said, in some of the extreme cases, it might be really important to amplify it. And I saw that was, um, you know, part of your question here, Lauren, um, as well. But I always think about the container, are, do they have a safe enough container or a strong enough c a container to really amplify that experience? Um, and if not, yeah, maybe we're working with just, you know, helping to regulate a little bit more and focus on, you know, some of the basic things. Yeah, I totally, I, I totally agree. I think there's something about what you're saying, Kyle, for me, that's first about meeting the person where they are in their process of integration as opposed to really, you know, getting excited about where we think people can be. And, you know, it's, I think as a listener, you can hear the potential of, of psychedelic stories and entheogenic stories. And it's when we feel potential as a, like empathic humans, we're like, oh my God, let's find a way to get you to that potential. But it's potential. Maybe there's a few steps on the way that has to be, maybe we need to create safety first. Maybe you need to learn how to just be relaxed in your body and just be in your body um, as opposed to like, transcend and become something totally different um so that's that's so first just meeting people where they are and you know i'm thinking about when i think about trauma work in psychedelics or entheogens i think about are people have people met some of these split off aspects of them like we talked about and then seeing what happens right so there is this process of are they in the process of reclaiming some part that went into hiding because of some trauma. I mean, we all have traumas. Everybody has trauma. I mean, we moved from the days of big T, small T. It's like, what font is your trauma more accurately now? <laughs> you know, how what size is it? Um, so like seeing what's there, where, they're, where are they in their relationship with this new aspect that's coming, with this traumatized unconscious material that's coming up, with maybe they got in contact with that young part that got traumatized. So what's their relationship? And really seeing what, how can I be, how can I be of support to facilitate the relationship in a place that it's not too, hopefully not too overwhelming or de disintegrating. And there is, like Adele said, there's a continuous like movement of information that we can start slowly learning from. Um, so I think about that. And I think the other part that I would love to hear what people think in the panel is if people got in touch with what, you know, uh, I call the golden shadow, like the, your, really those parts that are of you that went into hiding that are actually carrying your beautiful self, your spiritual self, your authentic self. Like maybe all of a sudden you got into connection with the fact that you were living a very small life and you need to be big. So what does that mean to be big? What happens to you when you think about taking more space? Like, do you feel comfortable? Do you like, is your nervous system going into like a distress mode? Like, right. So helping kind of integrate that and like helps, see the, the, that relationship. How do we foster a relationship with those beautiful parts of ourselves? Um, and based, yeah, so I guess that's, that's the two add-ons I just have. For this. Um, so much beautiful things have been shared already. <laughs> so I can just add a, a little bit. Um, yeah, I really echo the meeting where people are at. So what you know, I, I keep on coming back to this idea of capacity and container again and again and again. And so I think the basics is just understanding the foundation of where they're at. What's the support network that they have? Um, even before they, you know, if people are coming curious about psychedelics, like that's such a fundamental aspect to look at. 
And so I think with integration work, you know, sometimes it's really, as Kyle was mentioning, like, it's just about <laughs> getting someone back here. And, you know, also a huge, I think, piece in the start of integration work when you're working with someone is understanding what's their capacity. So not trying to push too hard, not having an agenda. And this is really where the quality of attunement comes in. It's like, okay, how do I really attune to like what's needed? Um, and I'd say the only thing I'll, I'll add is, is kind of building off of what Adele was saying is, I think there is this translation piece of, you know, some people are just really confused by their experiences. And so sometimes they're just like, I have no idea. I went to hell. I have no idea what that is. It was horrible. It was overwhelming. I had all this fear. And, you know, I think that that could be something that's just an example, like that could be worked with for a very long time. Uh, but first, just starting with like, okay, can they get into the parasympathetic? <laughs> can they ground? Can they connect with themselves? Can they breathe? Can they dive into some activation and come out? And so it's, it's really, um, yeah, getting to know a person and, and their, their system and where they're at. And so um, really, I think a lot of work that I see, and I, I don't come from a traditional psychology background, but it's like, okay, a lot of these medicines come from vastly different cultures that have a whole world around it um, that make it more integrated culturally. And people are taking it and using it kind of in the Western place where it's like, we don't have that language around symbol around archetypes around this idea of being with the process is not <laughs> is not something that culturally we're really good at so um i think it's you know also an education piece of like okay how do you stay um connected with this and how do you keep you know what does this mean once again this translation it's like i i see kind of this work as bridging you know these worlds in some ways it's like how do you bridge something that's so different from from this cultural context. I love that, Deanna. And you know, I just want to echo that something that you were mentioning and Adele said before we recorded. It's also where where are we coming back to after the experience? Like that would that will impact your integration process tremendously. Right. And also who you did it with. I just talked to someone yesterday who was like, listen, I person who went and did a ceremony and said I felt like I was open on the table. And when the ceremony ended, I was left open. There was no, no question, no feedback, no, no tips even what, what to do now. I mean, it was her, this person's first experience. So they had zero information about what to do. And I think now this is eight months later, this person still feels like they were stranded on say, the surgery table. So like what environment are we, first of all, what environment you're having the experience with, which comes back to the preparation, like do the preparation, see that you're doing it with someone who, what systems of support and resources you already can set up for yourself before the experience, right? Do I already schedule a session with Deanna? I'm like knowing that a week after my ceremony, I go and I see Deanna and she's gonna help me, right? And also what family and environmental systems I go back to. If I go back to working, if I go to work in my addiction and I live in a really poor neighborhood that's full with addiction, that's gonna be a really big conflict for me. Because I'm trying, like you said, Lauren, to disrupt that patterning, but I'm going back to the place that's trying to like perpetuate my patterning. So how do we support that? Because that's will that will determine a lot of my integration process. So there's all these other like societal environmental aspects that feel really important and actually feel important for us to talk about. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, having been on the receiving end of individuals who've had psychotic breaks or um, really, really serious adverse, what I would refer to as an adverse event, unnecessary suffering, you know, um, I really feel like it's actually important that in a process of informed consent to allow people to know the range of possibilities. Um, and this idea, like I hear people say, trust, trust the process, trust the process. I don't want people to trust. I don't want people to trust because then it stops them from asking pointed questions and it stops them from asking about what resources are available and what methods people use. And, you know, another tagline that I've heard several times is like, um, you know, trust that whatever is happening needs to happen or needed to happen, you know, after a challenging experience. And personally, I believe that there is such thing as unnecessary suffering and that there are ways to learn and grow and evolve um, that are gentler 
and more contained. And I think that's really, really important for people who are more vulnerable mentally and medically. And so, um, you know, when you talked about preparation, like I, I couldn't agree more. Like to me, integration starts with a very robust preparation process, which involves uh, encouraging people to tell their family members, work out those difficult conversations on the front end, you know, in terms of what they're doing and why and so on and so forth, so that when they come back, it's easier, it's, it's, um, it's gentler. I guess that's the word, but not easy. Nothing about this is easy. We're disrupting major systems for evolutions, but it's, it's gentler on the system. And I mean, the, the body system, I'm talking about the family system, I'm talking about the societal system. So at all those levels, you know, to be considered. And I'm sorry to go on a tangent, but I will. Um, because no, Adele, you bring up something that I, I want us to talk about, which is, I think, again, if we're talking to the Burning Man community, I know that's really there and it's very prominent in the psychedelic community, this idea of, oh, just trust. Trust the process, trust the ceremony. And if you don't, there is something wrong with you, which actually means we're already establishing a relationship of shame with people before they even went into the experience. Oh, you're terrified, you're scared, you're anxious, just trust. And if you can't, oh, then there is something wrong. As opposed to like, wait, I don't know you. I don't know this space. I just got into know this other 20 people sitting around me. How do you expect me to just plunge into like this trust, right? So I think about, uh, I love what you said, Adele. I think there is a way in which in the preparation, we can really think and reflect with people about the difference between conscious trusting and unconscious plunging which is what these communities are supporting. Like, oh, just plunge into trust. I'm like, I don't know. If I had like traumas around trust, this will feel incredibly dangerous for me. And I'm already, you asking me to do it is already gonna get me into a nervous system traumatized state. Like, oh wait, I'm not doing it right. There's something wrong with me. There's something wrong. Like there's something wrong here. So it's so important to just this demystify all these like requirements for the process. It's so, like Kyle said, it's so personal and there's so many things we can do as facilitators to help people feel that they get what they need to walk into those experiences as prepared as they feel they need to be, as opposed to what's being told. Sorry, I had to go on that tangent. I just want to flag one thing. Um, I, I love that this is being brought up. <laughs> so I'm very passionate about not everyone doing psychedelics. <laughs> so. Um, and finding the right container and people asking questions. I feel like if people won't answer your questions, don't work with them. That's, that's my kind of baseline. Um, but I just want to flag like we're in the time of COVID, Burning Man's not happening at Burning Man. And I think there's a lot of people being like, okay, there's a lot of stuff there that I can work with, but just the encouragement to find the right container. Um, and I think more and more people are, you know, turning locally to find people who are working with medicines locally. and so asking about training or you know i mean i know with ketamine for example there's no official like traditional training but what work has the person done <laughs> you know getting curious about them about their history have they worked with this medicine personally because i know there's some ketamine therapists that have not worked with ketamine so it's just it's like okay it's like getting really curious about what what is the container what's the relationship there how can i think about support system how can i ask these questions around family around how can I set it up beforehand and just kind of, yeah, with that kindness for yourself and that gentleness for yourself of like, cause you never know. I still get afraid when I go into a ceremony. I was talking about this yesterday with Ido. It's like, I still have fear come up and I'm like, cause you don't know what's going to come up. You don't know. It's like, okay. So really how do you build that? Ex like expand this time once again around the, the ceremony experience. Yeah, this is such a wonderful conversation. And um, yeah, Deanna and Adele, you, you kind of brought up like informed consent a little bit around that. Like what, what can come up? Like, I, we don't know. And I remember chatting with uh, Larry Norris from Erie way back when we were um, putting our integration course together. And it was like, 
what is psychedelic informed consent? Can we really prepare people? And that was a really interesting question, you know. Um, you know, we can talk about theoreticals and talk about the range of experience, but, and then just thinking about like trusting that process. And I think kind of like that shadow aspect of it, you're like, yeah, maybe you're in a really crappy situation with a really bad facilitator. You know, just thinking about some of the stuff I've stumbled across here and there of like really bad facilitators doing dangerous things and they're telling you to trust the process. How do they take advantage of you? Are they putting you in dangerous situations? And then um, I just kind of did a presentation about HPPD a couple of weeks ago and just thinking about when people are traumatized from psychedelic experiences, you know, how do you build trust around that? And, oh, yeah, you didn't do it right. Like, and that's why you developed this thing. It's like, sometimes these things can be traumatizing. And how do we really like just... Um, acknowledge that and just think about like some of the spiritual bypassing that can come up it's like oh you just need to keep doing it and and you know just keep going in and trusting it's like mm, i don't know maybe you should question that and feel feel what's right to you if you have a sense that this doesn't feel right then um you know how do you have more agency over your experience so, yeah thanks for bringing all that up it's really important these are such profound tools and i think it's really important to be a conscious like participant and to be like, eyes open. So to everybody's point, like to ask the questions, to be in a space of deep, deep trust with whomever it is that you're sitting with in the same way that you would want to be with someone who's giving you brain surgery. I mean, this is spiritual surgery. And it's, it's true that we live, I live in a context where it can be immensely dysregulating to come back from an experience and be in, in a world that isn't as integrated as perhaps certain shamanic indigenous like tri you know tribal communities and i'm just so excited about this conversation and, and what you're all sharing adele you had brought up earlier uh, what happens for individuals in the context of their families so coming back after a profound experience and what might present in a family system I'd love to hear from you guys about, about that. Yeah, um, I, I participated in the Hoffman process a number of years ago, and I really appreciated it because as part of their preparation materials, they asked you to have conversations with your family and your friends about some of the changes that might come about as a result of the experience. And I was impressed by that. Um, in, in my work with uh, family therapy and family systems, what I see sometimes is that um, in, in the context of individual therapy, clients are encouraged to be assertive and speak their truth and set limits and have boundaries for the very first time sometimes. Um, but what doesn't always happen is to warn the person that when they do that, the automatic reaction that is culturally based will be of defensiveness, of pushing back. And so one of the things that I recommend or I think can be helpful is to prepare the person to prepare their system for these changes in a way that is loving and compassionate. So for example, I learned that I don't always honor myself by telling the truth about how I feel and what I need. You're really, really important to me. Your relationship is one of the most important in my life. I wanna try showing up in a different way can we sort out a way to renegotiate our unconscious contracts so that um, I can get there in a space that feels safe and loving with someone I really care about? That will go really differently than someone who says, I realize that um, you use criticism to motivate. I'm done with it. It's painful. All true. All true. But I really do feel like if people can get guidance on how to navigate a reformulation or a restructuring of the system, that they will actually do better and get more of what they need and want because I don't think they wanna breach relationships for the most part, but they want them to be different so that they themselves can show up differently in that relationship in a way that's more aligned. So that preparation piece, I just, you know, underline again, and that smoothing out of some of these disruptive processes, because we are culturally conditioned to respond with defensiveness when someone approaches us in a way that is critical, it's natural. I do it all the time, even though I know it, I have to pivot from it, but I don't know if I'll ever get to a place of 
having zero defensiveness, you know? So that's just one of the kind of small tips or tricks that I feel have been helpful for some people. I think one way in which I explain it, and I think it's very similar to some of what Adele said, is that I think about, you know, more kind of classic system theory, which is, right, every system is a living organism. So every living organism is built for equilibrium and survival. So when a member of that organism tries to, to come with new information, right, like the hero's journey, like you went on a trip, you're coming the return part, right? So the organism has, and this is a generalization, but I think it kind of captures, it has three options. I either reject the person, I reject that part that's trying to change it, or I reject the system will reject the change, or the system will adjust and accept it. And I think that that's, in some systems, it's very rigid, it will be either or, but I think in other systems, it can actually be on a, on a fluid, like um, a kind of a fluid process. It can start as a rejection, but maybe then there is like a softening and a listening, and then time will pass, and there's like a micro acceptance, and a little bit will change, and then there will be. And I think that's what happens for a lot of people when they come back. It's they meet that initial response, like Adele said, of like the system is like, wait, 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 what do you mean? What do you mean you're trying to change? You can't change. We know you as one way, and we know you in the system as one way. You can't mess with that because it messes our equilibrium, which is code word of the system for like, wait, you're making us look at ourselves. Like, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that change. We don't want to do that work. Um, so I think what's, what I really try to remind people I work with in the groups is that to think about it as a process, and that in that process, we have to be to accept that the system is going through something too. When I re-enter my system in a different way, the system is going through an experience. So Adele, you said compassion. So like having compassion to that. I can resolve my, my, my maternal tra trauma and come back to my mom and want to lay it on her, but she's just being exposed to it. Like she needs some time to digest that as well and to understand what that means for her. And I think a lot of the times we forget that the system has a process as well. So I think patience is really important, like really being patient with this healing process and this re restructuring process. Um, but also in that process, making sure that we're not collapsing our, our experience and our new and our, our personal integration process, which is different than the systems integration process. Like I can share, when I started getting into this world, my parents were freaked out because they had associations that had to do with that world that it means because they come from the medical model, that it means drugs, it means bad, it means addiction, it means all these psychosis, all these other things. And now they call me and they send me documentaries about ayahuasca and articles and ask me why I don't release more like stuff and stuff like this. And it's been, a, it's been an eight year process. It's been an eight year healing. So thinking about it with, as, a, as a fluid process that has a lot to do with patience as well. Yeah, my parents are uh, the same. <laughs> um, yeah, and I just think, you know, uh, we're social beings, right? And I think relationships at the core of like who we are. And when I really think about a lot of the clients I've worked with in the past, a lot of the integration work really kind of comes back to relationships, right? Either relationships with your family, your significant other, friend groups, relationship with your boss and job, um, and how disruptive that can be. And, you know, kind of being on the other side, um, you know, receiving emails from, um, you know, maybe parents that said, hey, like I um, had a son or daughter take a trip and then they're totally different. And I'm feeling, I don't know how to hold that, right? And like, that's really challenging when there is a huge disruption within these systems and the system has to really readjust. So yeah, I just love the patience part, you know, I think that is so important. How do we really kind of sit with these experiences? And, you know, there, there are those times where it's like, oh, okay, I just need to like quit everything or push this person away. And it's like, is that always the best thing? And I think kind of what you were saying, Adele, boundaries, like how do we set boundaries? And maybe it's not always pushing them away completely, but being able to just create those healthy boundaries in the relationship yeah we're doing a ketamine study right now this week actually and <clears throat> we built in the study that a family member loved one is present for the preparation session they can attend the dosing sessions they receive two sessions during the course of the protocol themselves so that they can get support 
to manage what might be coming up, but also so that it could, they can learn new strategies to communicate effectively with their loved one. And so we're really trying to walk the talk and formally integrate caregiver support from beginning to end. In fact, the MDMA study that we're doing with MAPS is the first one to systematically bring in a caregiver from preparation all the way to closing. And so my goal is to advocate for a much broader uh, systemic healing for individuals working with psychedelic medicines. In fact, we're doing a panel on, on families and psychedelic medicine. And I think that when we can have these questions at the front of our mind, we'll be able to find creative solutions to make the transitions easier for the people who are you know, doing this really good work. That's incredible. No, I just wanted to say that that sounds incredible. And I can't wait to read the, the, the findings. It sounds amazing. Yeah. Yeah, me I just a had a cheerleader of moment of like, go Adele, go. <laughs> That's really great. Like, yeah, that really touches my heart. And, you know, I think it's also part of the issue is that in the West, it's so individual how we take this therapy and counseling. And so I'm just so happy to hear that you're, you're doing it in that way. Good work. Yeah, it reminds me when I um, was working with people with extreme states in early episodes of psychosis, and we had a psychiatrist that was really into open dialogue, and just thinking about the family members that were more open to meeting and working um, with, you know, us and then the, um, their, you know, their son or daughter, um, you know, just seeing how effective that was and really educating um, the family system around these states and, you know, just seeing how, who is more involved in seeing the outcome versus people that really took an individual path and there was no family system. So I think that's, that's amazing. I'm excited. <laughs> uh, just at the sake of being in balance, like I also want to mention that we have to make sure we're not doing the push away and then just, you know, creating a community that's all like people who are like, right? Because that's the other side of this, of this conversation of systems, right? I've seen, I think there is a way in which cutting off, like you said, Adele, and you said, Kyle, like cutting someone off, like splitting from our relationship is a really good instance medication against suffering and against challenge, right? So we just do this cutoff as opposed to actually stay on that edge of relationship and interaction and friction and see, okay, what is there? Is there some, is it actually an opportunity for me to deepen this relationship as opposed to separate? And that's a, and I think for myself included, when we get to that fire, we need support. We need someone to help us see that our desire to split, to sever, is actually a reaction sometimes as opposed to a solution. And that if we go then and form this echo chamber of people who are exactly like us or we just echo back everything that we say, that's not really, that's a very sterilized environment. That's not an environment that really, like, that really promotes, I think, authentic growth. That comes also from challenge, right? So I think it's just to like highlight that, that idea that to really notice when I'm trying to sever or separate to really actually be curious about what's fueling that desire. Psychedelics can so powerfully support us in our individual journeys of being here with what is, even when it's really challenging. And I too put on my cheerleader uniform, Adele, when I was listening to you speak about the way in which you're integrating family systems in the research. Thank you, thank you. And I'm aware that psychedelics is often, like the psychedelic community in the West is often uh, judged and kind of criticized for the ways in which it has blind spots in larger systemic issues. And I'm curious to hear how you see and imagine psychedelics informing activism, informing uh, anti-racism work, and like how the integration process really needs to like include more. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I will chime in and just kind of say something quickly before I have to um, step out of here. Um, I just kind of always come back to something like Jack Kornfield says, you know, um, ecstasy and then come back and do the laundry or take the trash out and really thinking about that, that work, right? Like it's hard. Um, and that is where the work is. And so we, we need to be, you know, more inclusive and we need to go out there and make the change. And I think, um, you know, when I talk about integration, I talk about like the grounding, the, the processing. And sometimes we can get just caught up in meaning making and, and processing and I get caught up in process loops all the time and can get stuck there and actually never taking that action. 
moving into the 3D world. Um, and, you know, as much as like, I don't know, I feel like sometimes the psychedelic community or spiritual communities want to transcend this life. Well, we're here right now. And so how do we make this place better for everybody? Um, and how do we include everybody? And, you know, this is something I guess like death has taught me, like I've spent a lot of time wanting to transcend and, and leave this place at times. But then I, I realized like, you know, it's really challenging to be here um, when you've kind of had an exposure of the numinous and what the potential is out there. But I mean, this is your experience right now. And, and you know, this is all we kind of really know. And so how do we get out there and, and do the work? Um, so I encourage everybody, if you're having big experiences, go out there, take the laundry out, take the, the trash out um, and do the work. It's, it's important. We're not going to change unless we, we actually move it into this 3D world. So I'm going to leave it at that. Take care, everybody. Bye, Kyle. I, I love that you asked that, Lauren. I mean, I remember we talked about this in your podcast when it was in the midst of this, the... <clears throat> beginning of the racial political collapse in, in the US. I think in my mind, this is my personal opinion, I think there is a very uncomfortable conversation that needs to happen in the psychedelic world about how right now capitalism is the main force that's guiding where funding and research is going, which means that all the, rate, the minority groups are being overlooked because they're not profitable. And I've heard this directly from CEOs of psychedelic startups and even from schools who were considering doing psychedelic research. And once they saw that it's not gonna be profitable serving underprivileged populations, they killed the project. There is a big, and I mean, I know this sounds a little like Saturnian, very like harsh, like this is, this is reality, like, but it's true. We are the psychedelic research now, and I get it. We want to go towards legalization, which means we need to provide data that shows that it works. We need to make it safe. We need to make it right. We need to show proof. And how can we do that without actually contributing to, the, to sustaining the same power structures that do create oppression, racial like separation, sexism, issues with mental health, that people who are supposed to have access to this don't. The people who can benefit the most are light years away from having access to ketamine treatments, to MDMA treatments, to psilocybin treatments, to ayahuasca like <clears throat> um, retreats. And there is a big conversation there. How do we start funneling attention and funding and research without worrying about profit? Because if we're really I mean, for me, I, I get it, but at the same time, there is a paradox. Most of us come out of this experience understanding what Diana said, the, the importance of the village. We're all in this together. And we, if we don't invest in the, in the together, we're perpetuating the Western mind of separation and aloneness. So how do we actually start giving up profit for the together, for the healing of the collective? Because we, I believe in individual transformation. I think individuals will change the collective. But if we neglect the collective, the collective will fight back and it won't want to change. Because why? If you don't invest in me, if you neglect me, if you reject me, if, you're, if you oppress me, why should I collaborate? So I wish we can talk about how we start that conversation and who needs to have that conversation. But I think there is a really, given Adele, what you said about blind spots, there is a serious, it's not even a bind spot, it's a spot we already saw and we're choosing to ignore, which is yeah. even worse in my mind. Yeah, well, I mean, my approach to that is to um, be patient and compassionate and also being very committed to forward moving action. I was really interested in research that looks at um, emotions that underlie action in the context of political parties. And, um, I think that there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear. And if we think about, okay, what, what's the best way to help transform fear and increase safety and trust? I think we have to be guided by some of those principles in terms of bridging this gap with whoever it is who holds the purse strings. Um, so that it doesn't, uh, I mean, I do, I do believe that there's a strong need for advocacy and strength and also gentleness and bridging. Um, and I think that that happens on an individual level. And I know for myself, I'm really looking forward to creating a working group of representatives from each of the psychedelic companies 
so that we can come together as individuals, know each other as individuals, and from that place, um, move forward in a good way. Um, so that's kind of like the broader thought, but there's so much more to be done. And I, I admit, I don't have all the answers, but questions and conversations like these, I think are what is going to kind of guide the way. I think of the North Star Ethics Pledge. I'm so grateful for the group of individuals who are behind that. Like it's so beautiful. So I've referenced it so many times. And then it reminds me of something else that um, someone shared with me. And I believe it was Harvey Schwartz, um, who I really have a lot of respect for. He's really a great guy and an amazing clinician. And if I'm not mistaken, he talked about how we can integrate social advocacy within the integration process, but it needs to be timed well. And so how I interpreted it was that, you know, after the grounding, after the processing, after the integration that's happening on the individual level, at that point, we can propose, encourage, suggest, or even just talk about how integration can be extended within the culture. Um, so, okay, now that you are grounded, processed, integrated, do you feel called? Is this something that could support you? And if not, that's okay too, because I really do believe that timing is everything. And so, yeah, there, are, there, are, there we have to have so many more conversations about this and to figure it out. Um, but hopefully those thoughts are helpful. No, I love what you're saying. You know, you're making me think about what feels, I don't know, I, I'm gonna think how, if at all, I can contribute, but I think what's missing is the conversation between, I love your initiative, the idea of bringing all these, um, all the people who are starting these companies together, but I would actually want them to talk to the people who work with these populations. Of course. Of I think course. that's where there is a gap in the bridge. I think, you know, from what I get, I'm like, wow, you guys are, there is a serious disconnect between the idea and the actual work and the actual reality of what's happening on the ground. So I would love to see that bridge. So thank you. I think that's now you're making me realize where the bridge is, where another bridge is necessary. And I, I think it also comes back again to a more indigenous ideology around this reciprocity. And so I guess that's what I'm hearing, you know, when you're saying, okay, there's, you know, currently what's funding, you know, what funds capitalism is, is exploitation and greed and things like this. And it's, that's just where we're at. That's well, the system that we're currently operating in North America. All of us live in North America right now. That's the system that's kind of we're operating in. And so it's like, how do we find ways to, to challenge that? How do we, I remember Joe talked about it, Joe Tafur in um, a panel that we did with Kyle and Ido around the shadow component of psychedelics. And he's like, how do you make decisions that are basically life-giving in terms of, is this gonna cause harm in this generation, the next generation? Like, how do we think about that? or not. And so it's, it's also about a larger kind of, you know, what's the intention behind, behind the decisions that are being made? And where are you coming from energetically when you're making these? And so it's, I think it's a friction <laughs> that we're going to be bumping up against. And, you know, I think it's like a yes and not a but. So all hands, no but. <laughs> Such a juicy conversation. I have one more question. How can therapists and, and facilitators or sitters who are working with clients integrating psychedelic experiences or having the psychedelic experience integrate the experience? Because of course it's going to impact their nervous system too. What are, what are kind of best practices or tools that you would suggest and offer? I think we should start a, a counter transference training for shamans. That's first of all. Uh, that would be, I, I'm not joking. That would be amazing. That actually came from, uh, I, met a, I met you years ago in the psychedelic conference in Oakland. And that's where that idea was birthed because I had so many conversations with practitioners who have, who are like not even aware of the concept of being projected on and what it takes. And so I think as a facilitator, therapist, coach, whatever you are, first of all, being aware of that concept of projection and kind of transference and what that means and actually that that's an energetic emotional based interaction and not a mind based interaction which i think if anything intersects psychology with shamanism or with the psychedelic world because we're moving we're talking about energy exchange as opposed to mental exchange um 
one, I think, you know, just coming from my own like psychology training and being a trainer of psychologists, uh, being aware of our own, our own theories about what is healing. I think a lot of times we develop these theories about what's healing and then we want to put them on people as opposed to let the individual tell me what they need and then for me to kind of try and see how can I fit into this? How can I support? And that for me is automatically linked to our own woundedness. A lot of people who are, you know, I don't, that was the stereotype that a lot of people who are, you know, like um, want to do this kind of work are actually wounded themselves, right? So they become the caretaker in order to heal the wounded, but they are themselves wounded. And there's a whole cycle of attachment and love there and all this other stuff. But I think being aware of our own wounds and how they might fuel our own self-importance or, or narcissism. Because that, that automatically creates a situation or a power dynamic where I know and you don't. I have the answer and, you just, and I just have to give it to you. As opposed to, I think, what we all, I don't know, I'm gonna, pro I'm gonna project on all of us that we will agree that eventually you learn that it's a shared journey. We're just walking together. Sometimes I do, sometimes that's true. I do have more training and more like I invested in my life. So I might have information you don't, but that doesn't mean I know the answer. I can just point out certain things and if it resonates, we go. And if it's not, you're always the expert on your experience. So those for me would be like the main points to really be mindful of. One of the ways that I start my session is by acknowledging the mentors and healers who have brought me to this place in the present moment for a number of reasons. One, I want my clients to know that I do my own personal psychotherapy. And I really do believe that um, this is my belief and it's a bit black and white. <laughs> I guess it can't really be a bit black and white. That's funny. But I really do believe that if you are supporting others in doing vulnerable work, whether it's in the psychedelic space or in psychotherapy, that it is essential for you to do your own work because it is also impossible for you to know all of your blind spots and to be aware of them and to be, you know, be uh, fully present in that space for the other. It's just not possible with how we are constituted as organisms at this point in our evolution. I remember in my training, they would say, check your stuff at the door but you can't actually do that. That doesn't actually make sense. And so um, I really feel strongly about people having either a process of self-inquiry or participation in their own you know, uh, psychotherapy, whatever that looks like for others. Um, I think it's our responsibility to do that and to do it regularly. And the other kind of quote or mantra that guides me in my work and my understanding of how I fit is that I heal myself to heal others. I heal others to heal myself. You could switch the order depending on the day, um, but that that guides me. And I know that when I was going through a really tough time in my life, um, going through fertility treatments, it was like the weirdest thing. My caseload was full of people who were either, you know, trying to get pregnant, pregnant, going through treatments, or grieving the loss. And I was like, oh my gosh it brought that to me in a whole new way. Like I was so, so, so grateful that I already had structures in place to find that support. But I just think that we're denying our humanity if we convince ourselves that the work we do with our clients doesn't affect us every single time in some way, shape or form. Yeah, I, one of the biggest words that comes up for me is humility. You know, obviously to know your, know your power, know your strengths, to know your boundaries, know your limitations. I think all of that's really healthy. But um, yeah, I worked at an ayahuasca center for almost four years. And so I got the projections of, you know, all the best things you can imagine and also all the horrific things. And so it just showed me like, wow, like I can show up in the exact same way in a circle. And some people think I'm the best person ever. And some people are going to be like, I hate her. She's horrible. And so it's just, it makes it so obvious and it's like, okay. And then it's like, where does that touch my work? And so the importance of, yes, having those spaces where I can process that I can stay curious that I can, you know, walk my talk in terms of how do I, if we are thinking of integration as a lifestyle, how do I stay connected and curious about myself? And it doesn't mean that I can't have a moment where 
you know, I'm not, I can go have fun and party and play and that's great. And then, but it also means that I come back to myself. I have different ways. And so I think this is also about the community. And so that can be a therapist and it can also be friends and it can also be, you know, all of these different, these different um, ways. And I, I appreciate Adele you saying like, I heal myself to heal others and others heal to heal me. And, you know, it's, I, I've talked to so many therapists recently where it's like, that they integrate something the next day or later that day someone's showing up with the same thing it's like how do we see the humanity in each other and it's just like okay you know i'm someone who's who's trying to walk this path and it's like okay you want to come with me <laughs> and, and have an exchange that way and so you know this is also kind of answering your last question in terms of just those those power dynamics um, within a, a therapeutic relationship. It's like, how do we also start to shift that? And how do we have mechanisms in place that can also allow, like, to mirror us back to ourselves? And notice, like, I think this is also where it's really healthy to start learning about tracking your own nervous system. It's like, okay, <laughs> what's really going on? Because sometimes there's the mental level of what's happening, and then your body's telling a very different story in terms of what's happening with a particular client. And so maybe they're, you know, maybe they're activating you and triggering old trauma. Maybe it's that you love that projection of being the one that's supporting them and helping them. And so it's, it's really, I think, once again, about um, staying humble and also getting to, to know yourself really well. I just want to add one thing, Lauren, before, um, I know that you are part of it and so I want to just add another thing to what Adele said as far as doing your own self-work. And I want to really advocate for doing your work with others. So if you're a practitioner, especially now, which is very lacking, I think, in the psychedelic world, find a group like Deanna, I, I, myself, and Kyle. We uh, <clears throat> co-facilitate, for example, a, a consultation group for people who provide preparation and integration. And it's been become this most beautiful space and one of the feedbacks we consistently get is how isolated people felt before. And that they felt like if they could get consultation, it was mostly like psychologically oriented as opposed to really having a psycho-spiritual frame, which is so necessary given that we are taking traditions and practices from indigenous shamanic cultures and transferring them to the West. And so really actually, and I think as a healer, as a practitioner, it's one of the more vulnerable things you can do, which is be accountable in front of other people. It's one thing to do your own work or do it with your therapist, but to actually open yourself to having a multiple people who have different perspectives respond and also maybe kind of mirror something back to you. I think that's where there is like another whole other set of growth and self-reflection that can come that cannot come in that isolation. And we need more of that in the psychedelic and theogenic world. We need more of those groups where we support each other as practitioners. Wow, wow, wow. I'm so grateful for this extra juicy conversation. And, you know, just to, to put my voice in it as well, I, I too, Adele, find myself all over my practice and feel so deeply motivated. I don't think anything motivates me into me more fully than understanding that that's what I get to like, where I get to take the people I serve. And I love your mantra. I believe that we still live in a very disintegrated world and that the individual work that any one of us does belongs to our families, belongs to the larger collective, certainly belongs to us, but that it is incumbent upon each individual heart to take that journey home and that all progress is return and that we should be, you know, continue, continue to travel along these paths with ourselves, with one another, and with the people that, that come our way. So, so, so grateful, so full. Like my heart is super happy. And I, I thank you all for sharing your time, your wisdom, your work and experiences with me and with, with the, the audience here. Thank you, Lauren, for facilitating this and providing such a beautiful container for us to be able to touch on the range of issues, you know, so really appreciate your presence and your spirit. Yeah, thank you so much, Lauren. I just want to echo that we this is the conversations we need to have more of and make it, like you said, as accessible to everyone who wants to learn more information so we can start bridging those gaps. Thank you so much for putting this together. And to the K-Dome. Thank you for the K-Dome. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you, Lauren, and thank you, Ido, and thank you, Adele and Kayo. Um, yeah, it's been a pleasure, and I echo some more of these conversations that are had. I think it's like we can do that work together. You know, this is also the collective piece that we're we're tapping into right now. So yeah, thanks everyone. <laughs>